In today's lecture, we will be covering biomechanical measurement, analysis, and modeling. In the first part of today's lecture, I will be reviewing the basics of measuring and analyzing kinematic data. It should be noted that much of what you learn in today's lecture will be very relevant to your performing of the kinematic data analysis laboratory assignment. Here we see an illustration of some kinematic data that's being measured from a person in motion. The stick figure is representing the person. The grey dots are representing measurements that we've made of the location in space of the various uh, anatomical landmarks on the body. The grey dots here potentially represent markers that are used by a motion tracking system to measure, to measure body position in space. Here we see a picture of a semi motion uh, tracking system being used to record the sagittal plane kinematics during locomotion. The colored lights are the tracking markers. I'm showing you this particular motion tracking system as this is the system that you'll be seeing in, seeing in action during the running analysis lab that you'll do later in the semester. We see here then that the gray dots are showing us the position in space of the markers placed on the shoulder, pelvis, knee, ankle and foot. We can see each measurement has two coordinates, X and Y. And that in our example, the X coordinate is telling us, telling us the position of the dot along the anterior posterior axis, the AP axis, and the Y coordinate is telling us the position of the dot along the inferior superior axis. Here we've used subscripts, subscripts to give a number to each dot, such that X1 and Y1 are the X and Y coordinates of the first marker, which is the shoulder. You will also notice that uh, we have frame one written on the diagram. That is because motion capture systems take multiple successive measurements of position or, or pictures uh, so that we can record how movement patterns unfold over time. An important distinction to make at this point is between directly measured variables and derived variables. Using this particular motion capture system, we are directly measuring the positions of each of the markers attached to the patient. Alternatively, if we were wanted to directly measure uh, angle, we could use something like an electrogoniometer. If we were uh, in the case that we have here, if we're interested in more than position, for example, if we wanted to know what maximum knee flexion we observe for this patient as they walk on the treadmill, then we would need to derive that measure of knee flexion from our direct measurements of position. Here we see some data that was collected using a motion tracking system. In the first column we have the frame number and in the next column we see the value of position that was measured on that frame. We see that the column is labeled x1 from this, we can assume that we're looking at the x-coordinate value for marker number one. This was the marker that was placed on the shoulder. The next thing to do uh, when you see data like this is to ask, what do the numbers that we're seeing represent? First, what are the units? Are they inches, feet, millimeters, centimeters, meters? After that, you want to ask, what does it mean for the numbers that we're seeing to be higher or lower? What's the difference between 0 and 58? In this case, the units are in millimeters, and based upon the coordinate system that we had depicted on the previous slide, a larger number of x is associated with having moved anteriorly. The next thing to ask is, what do different, different, is what do different frames mean? In motion tracking, the frame rate tells you how many frames of movement you are recording each second. The frame rate for the, the data that we're seeing here is four frames per second. Or, to use more technical language, this means that the data has a sampling frequency of four hertz. In other words, the sampling of data occurs four times every second. 
If we know the sample frequency, we can use this to work out the amount of time that elapses between each measurement. The time that uh, the, uh, the time that uh, occurs between two samples is referred to as the sample period. The sample period is equal to one divided by the sample frequency. This is the general relationship between frequency and period, that frequency equals one over period. So one divided by four is equal to 0.25 seconds. What we've just done here is determine that there is a is that there is one quarter of a second between each measurement of position. Using this information, we can create a new column with time data in it. So we can see that on frame th on frame three, we're at time uh, 0, 0 0.75 seconds. And as we go in between, as we go from frame to frame, as we go down, we we uh, have uh, quarter second increments. With our series of time values and our series of position values, we can create a, gr a graph called a time series. Here then, we have a time series graph of position values. In this graph, we can see that the individual data points that we have in our data table are displayed as colored dots. The pattern of movement that we're seeing here takes us from 0 to 60 millimeters in about one second. This is showing us that in the recording we're seeing the body swaying forward by about six centimeters. A moment ago when I said that the uh, movement goes from zero to sixty millimeters in one second, I effectively calculated the average velocity of the movement. The average velocity of this movement then is approximately sixty millimeters per second. Velocity is calculated by taking the change in position, delta x, and then dividing that by the change in time, delta t. We can get a more accurate measure of velocity than compared to the average velocity calculation we talked about a second ago by looking at the change in position that occurs over the smallest unit of time that we can measure. In our data table, the smallest time interval that we've got access to is the sample period that here uh, in our data is 0.25 seconds. Let, uh, let's look then at how we calcul uh, would calculate velocity in the most accurate way that we can. So velocity is the, cha is the change in x divided by the change in, uh, to, uh, to, to, by the cha cha uh, the change in y. In order to perform this calculation on the data, we need uh, the data that we have on time and the data that we have on position. So we can look at the change in, the change in x and the change in time. Uh, we can get the, uh, we can get the, ch the change in time and change in position we, uh, we need by calculating how the, pos the values of time and position change as we go from frame to frame. To do this, we can get the values from one frame and subtract them from the values on the previous frame. When we try to do this for the first frame, we'll see that uh, it's not actually possible. And the reason for this is that when we're looking at the uh, at the first frame, we don't actually have a previous fr frame to to do this. So we're going to ignore this bit. It does, however, work for the next frame. Starting with the change uh, change in position, if we take the current fr uh, current position for this frame, which is two point three, and then subtract it. Uh, from the position value on the previous frame, which is zero, then what we get is a value for change in position. We now want to divide this by the change in time, in which uh, uh, the change in time, which is the current value uh, of one minus the previous time value of 0.75. So we can do this, and we can calculate our, our velocities for each of, our, each of our frames. So here we see our data for velocity that was calculated using, uh, using our data. Um, when we go now and look at the graph, here we have the velocity values that we would get if we had a much higher sample rate. So 
here rather than ca making a calculation every one quarter, uh, having samples every one quarter of a second. This data is uh, t taken from data that was uh, where each each fr uh, each frame occurred one hundredth of a second from uh, after uh, after the other. Here we have a table of the basic kinematic variables of position, velocity, and acceleration. The table shows both the linear and angular versions of these variables. The typical it also shows the typical units for these variables and the symbol that is mo is most commonly used to represent them. The most common units you will see for linear position is meters. Linear position has the symbol S, but this symbol often gets replaced by the letter representing the coordinate axis that you're looking at, such as X or Y. Linear velocity has units of meters per second, and as we saw on the last slide, it's calculated as the rate of change of position, or in other words, the change in position divided by the change in time. Linear, linear acceleration has units of meters per second per second. Here we say we here here we have meters per per second, which is velocity per second. Acceleration then can be calculated by looking at the change in velocity that has has occurred and dividing it by the amount of time that the change occurred over. Angular position uh, that we often just refer to as angle often uses the symbol theta. It has units of either radians or, or degrees that we'll look at on the next slide. Angular velocity and ang uh, angular acceleration typically have the symbols omega and alpha, respectively. These values can be calculated in the same way as their linear counter counterparts. The two units of angular position are radians and degrees. You're probably all familiar with the idea that there's 360 degrees in a circle. You may be less familiar with radians. One radian is the angular distance covered when the arc length equals the radius. So one, uh, one ra radian is the angular distance that we, we have, have here when the arc length, which is the distance of this line here, has a length that's equal to the length of the radius. The angle theta that we've been looking at here in the picture has an arc, uh, arc length that's equal to the length of, of the radius of the circle. This is equivalent to 57.3 degrees. 360 degrees is equal to 2 pi radians, where pi is equal to approximately 3.142. Radians are the standard scientific units, or SI units, for measuring angle. Because of this, uh, even though radians are less intuitive than, de than degrees, you will repeatedly come across them in the literature. So, how do you go about measuring angles? To measure an angle, the first thing that you need, need to ask is, uh, what am I going to make my angular measurement relative to? There are two basic ways of measuring an angle. You can measure a relative angle or an absolute angle. Relative angles are joint angles. They, they are the angles formed between the longitudinal axes of two adjacent segments. Absolute angles are segment angles. They are the angle that is formed between the longitudinal axis of, of a segment and the right horizontal uh, line that's drawn from the distal end, distal end of a segment and drawn horizontally. An absolute angle is measured from an external frame of reference. It is typically the horizontal, the horizontal line of the ground plane, but the reference frame could also be the, the, vertical, uh, the vertical line uh, formed by the line of gravity. When your reference is the right horizontal, the usual convention is to measure the angle anti-clockwise from the right horizontal. So here we have right horizontal have a right horizontal. Uh, so we, we, we uh, identify the distal end of the, se the segment and we extend a line horizontally to the right. A relative angle is the angle formed between two limb segments. 
A relative angle can be defined as degrees of flexion. In that case, a fully extended position would be zero degrees, or it could be defined as the angle formed at the articulation, in which case um, a fully extended position would be measured as 180 degrees. Here we see some markers attached to the, bo to the body for measuring sagittal plane kinematics. Typically, in simple analyses of kinematic motion, tracking markers are placed um, over approximate centers of joint rotation. Many kinematic analyses do not require fancy motion capture technology. If you set up a well-positioned video camera and place highly visible markers at carefully chosen places on the body, many calculations can be performed with a pretty acceptable degree of accuracy. Over the next few slides, we will consider how absolute and relative angles can be calculated from the joint position data that's often recorded using motion capture systems. Let's start by looking at how we can calculate an absolute angle. Here we have the x and y coordinates for marker, for, for marker 3 and marker 4. Using our diagram from earlier, marker 3 is the knee and marker 4 is the ankle. The ankle is the distal end of the segment, so our reference line for calculating uh, the angle theta is the right horizontal line from the, angle, from the ankle. Angle theta can be calculated from the endpoint coordinates by using the arc tangent, or inverse tangent as it's sometimes, uh, uh, sometimes called. We know that tan theta is equal to the length of the side of the right tri triangle that is opposite to the angle theta, divided by the length of the side of the right triangle that is adjacent to angle theta. The opposite side is the vertical distance between marker 3 and marker 4. The length of this side of the triangle is equal to y subscript 4 minus y subscript 3. The adjacent side is the horizontal distance between marker 3 and marker 4. The length of this side of the triangle is equal to x4 minus x3. To calculate theta, we need to calculate the arc tangent or inverse ta tangent function of the, of the value of the opposite divided by the adjacent. Now let's look at the calculation of a relative angle. Here we see a relative angle formed between the shoulder, the hip, and the knee. This relative angle can be calculated in one of two ways. The first way that we're going to consider on this side is to use the law of cosines. In order to calculate theta using the law of cosines, we need to know three lengths. A, B, and C. We can calculate the lengths of A, B, and C using the Pythagorean theorem. A, in our example, is the distance between the hip and the shoulder. Here, we, uh, we can see in the formula here, we can calculate the length of A by calculating the difference but uh, the, the calculating the difference between the x positions of the shoulder and the hip and squaring the result, taking the difference between the y positions of the shoulder and, and the hip and squaring the result, adding these two numbers together, and then taking the square root of that result. Here we, uh, here we can see, uh, using the same technique, uh, how we would go about calculating the, the, uh, the lengths uh, b and c. With A, B, and C calculated, let's finally now look at the law of cosines. You can see that the only variables in this equation are A, B, C, and theta. In order to calculate theta, you simply need to plug A, B, and C that you can get from the, uh, the marker coordinates using the Pythagorean theorem as we just looked at, and then solve that equation for theta. 
Here I've rearranged the law of cosines that so, so that we can see how using a, b, and c we can calculate a value of theta. The second method for calculating a relative angle is to use the two absolute angles that we see, see here labeled theta subscript 1 and theta subscript 2. In your kinematics data analysis, the, for the laboratory part of this class, I would recommend that you use the first method that I, that, that I showed you rather than this method. Uh, this method can, ca can cause you headaches as it requires that you pay careful attention to what angle is being calculated. Um, also, also, how you would go about performing this particular calculation may change, where, change when the joint changes its configuration as the movement that you're uh, studying unfolds. So how can you get from a measure of angular motion to a measure of linear motion? How do you go from knowing something about the rotation of an object to knowing something about that object's linear motion through space? For example, if I'm rotating a bat through 180 degrees per second, how fast is the end of the bat going? The quantity I'm talking about here is the tangential velocity of the end of the bat. This is important as this particular physical property is what's going to determine how far the ball is going to go when I hit it. So, the linear velocity or acceleration of a point on a rotating segment is called the tangential velocity, v subscript t, or tangential acceleration, a subscript t. Here we see how we can convert between angular parameters and linear parameters. With reference to this figure, the tangential distance is shown as the dot as shown as the dotted line here is equal to the angle theta measured in radians multiplied by the radius that is the distance from the rotation point to the point whose motion we're looking at tangential velocity v script subscript t shown in red is calculated as angular velocity in radians per second multiplied by the radius. Tangential acceleration, shown in blue as a subscript t, is calculated as angular acceleration in radians, uh, in radians per second per second, multiplied by again the radius of uh, uh, the, uh, the radius. A subscript c at the bottom in purple is the centripetal acceleration. This is the linear acceleration that is directed towards the center of the circle. Centripetal acceleration is important when we're talking about centripetal forces. When you are swinging a baseball bat, you can feel, feel the bat trying to pull, uh, pull, uh, pull away from you as you, uh, as you swing it. You can, feel, you can feel it trying to pull itself out of your hand. The centripetal force is the force that is necessary to keep the bat in your hand. As, uh, as the bat is moving along its cur cur curved path. This force is directed inward towards the, the center of rotation, towards the point of rotation. So, centripetal acceleration is directed, is directed radially towards the center of, uh, of the circle and has a magnitude equal to the square of the body's tangential speed divided by the distance from the, the center of the circle to the moving body. It can also be calculated as the square of the angular velocity multiplied by the radius. To give you a bit of a sense of where this acceleration comes from, we need to look at the change in tangential velocity that is occurring in the movement. Here we see the initial tangential velocity at the beginning of the movement, shown as the light red arrow, and the final tangential velocity at the end of the movement, shown with the dark red arrow. Notice that the arrows are pointing in different directions to each other. The change in direction of these two arrows means that because of the rotation of this object, 
the velocity has ended up changing. Remember that a velocity is defined both in terms of the magnitude of the vector and the orientation of the vector. With the, uh, with the change in velocity that we see here, we by definition have an acceleration. Here we can see the two red tangential velocity vectors, as well as a purple vector that's showing us the change that's occurred between them. So the purple vector here is representing the difference or change that's occurred as we've gone from the beginning of the movement to the end of the movement. We see that the change from the initial vector to the final vector is directed towards the center of the, cir uh, the circle. So here we can see uh, why we're talking about a center-directed acceleration. Now let's look at how position data obtained from a motion capture system can be used to determine osteokinematics and arthrokinematics. In studies where it's important to measure osteokinematics and arthrokinematics, mar markers are placed on, paper on palpable anatomical landmarks. Here we see exam examples of the types of markers that are used in this kind of research. The 3D coordinates of such markers measured by the motion capture system, can be used to estimate the locations of the bones. In the right, we see a screen capture of some biomechanical analysis software being used to calculate the positions of bones in space based upon the position data re uh, recorded from the markers attached to the body. Doing this requires that you know the relationship between where a marker is placed on, uh, on the body and specific anatomical landmarks. Also requires that you have estimates of the relationship between anatomical landmarks and uh, and where the bones uh, and, where, and where the underlying bones are. This second step uses values that have been determined via uh, cadaver dissections and the data from MRI studies. Two concepts that you will encounter frequently in biomechanics are center of mass and center of gravity. Each body has a point called the center of mass about which its mass can be said to be evenly distributed in all directions. When subjected to gravity, the center of mass of a body closely coincides to its center of gravity. The center of gravity is the point about which the effects of gravity are completely balanced. Here we see a baseball bat, a bowling ball, and a crutch. For each ob object we see a blue dot that marks the position of the center of mass of that object. With the bowling ball we see that the center of mass is in the center of the object. This is because the mass of the object is distributed symmetrically around its center. For the baseball bat, as we discussed when we were talking about uh, introducing moments of inertia, there is more mass at the fat end of the bat than there is at the skinny end of the bat. This means that the center of mass is located more towards the fat end of the bat, so that, the, so that there is, is an equal amount of mass either side of that point. In these pictures, we're seeing that if a person wants to balance one of these objects on their fingers, then what they need to, need to do is position their fingers directly below the center of mass. Looking at the baseball bat, when we place a finger under the center of mass on the bat, then the torques produced by the pull of gravity acting on the mass in the, uh, in, uh, on the, in the fat end of the bat are exactly balanced by the gravitational torques that are pulling on the, the thin end of the bat. We can see then that the blue dot also represents the center of gravity, as, it is, as it's the point in which the, the pulls of gravity are equally balanced on either side of that point. You will see the concepts of center of mass and center of gravity used almost interchangeably in the literature. For all intents and purposes, for you guys, they refer to the same point. So, center of mass and center of gravity are interchangeable concepts. By this, and mean, by this I mean that for all intents and purposes, they refer to the same thing. 
To recap, center of mass is the point at which the distribution of mass is equal in all directions. It does not depend upon the gravitational field. Center of gravity is the point at which the distribution of weight is equal in all directions. It does depend upon the gravitational field. The crux of why these two concepts refer to the same thing for all intents and purposes is because the center of mass and center of gravity of an object are in the same position if the gravitational field in which the, in which the object is located is uniform across the object. For all intents and purposes for us, given that all actions occur on the surface uh, on the surface of the earth the similarity between these two concepts is always going to be true we can always assume that gravity has the same effect with only minuscule differences on all parts of the body so if you imagine that you uh, we were dealing with um people that uh were 400 miles tall then the effect of gravity on their head is likely to be significantly different than it is at their at their feet but for people like you you and me you and me that are less than 2 meters high this makes absolutely no difference to understand the forces and the torques that arise during a movement it's important to know what the masses of the body body segments are and where those masses can be said to be located the location of mass is going to be determined by the locations of the center of mass. The black dots in the picture here show the locations of the center of mass for each of the segments of the leg shown here. As well as determining what the center of mass is of a specific segment, we can calculate the center of mass for the, uh, an entire leg. This is shown with the two red dots. When you have a center of mass for multiple segments, the location of that center of mass will change as the segments move around. Here we can see that, this, uh, that, that for a straight leg, the center of mass is roughly located in the knee. In contrast, when the knee is flexed, the center of mass, mass shifts to a location behind the knee that's outside the body. The center of mass and center of gravity of the human body standing in the anatomic position lies just anterior to the second sacral vertebrae. Given the tendencies of men's bodies and women's bodies to have slightly different distributions of mass, the centers of mass of men tend to be slightly higher up, that is relative to body height, than it is in women's bodies. The center of mass of the whole body is an important concept for understanding how a person maintains a stable upright stance. That is, how they balance themselves. Here we see a simple diagram of the major biomechanical properties involved in maintaining balance. The red dot shows us the location of the center of mass. To recap, the center of mass of the body is the point where all of the mass of the body can on average said to be located. It's the point at which, if you were to hang the body up from that point, the body would not have a tendency to rotate. If we assume in our diagram here that the person is standing still, then we can assume a state of static equilibrium. This means that all the linear forces acting on the body will be balanced, and it means that all the rotary forces acting on the body are balanced. If we think, think of the body as balancing on the, on the pivot point at the ankle, then if the gravitational force vector resulting from the mass of the body falls in front of the, it falls in front of the ankle, then it will create a torque that will act to pull the body forwards. This destabilizing force is counteracted by a ground reaction force vector, shown in blue. The location at which the ground reaction force vector in blue originates is called the center of pressure. The center of pressure is the point where the resultant of all of the ground reaction forces is said to act. It represents a weighted average of all of the pressures over the, sur the surface of the area in contact with the ground. 
in order to not tip forwards, you can see that a plantar, flexor, a plantar flexion based ankle torque must be generated. In working through the material of this class, you will see force plates, or force platforms as they're alternatively called, mentioned multiple times. A force plate is a device that uses a set of strain gauges inside it to measure the vertical, medialateral, and anterior-posterior components of ground reaction forces. The composition of these vectors can, uh, gives us the magnitude and direction of the ground re reaction force vector. A force plate can also be used can be also be used to accurately measure the location of the center of pressure. In the pictures here, we can see two examples of using force plates in in uh, in research. Down the bottom here, we see a an instrumented treadmill. This is a treadmill that has some force plates embedded inside it and therefore we can measure the ground reaction forces that occur uh, um, during, uh, during the stance phase of gait. Up the top here we can see a person standing on top of two force platforms. Using the data from these force platforms we can calculate the uh, ground reaction force vector and we can also calculate the, lo uh, the location of the origin of that ground reaction force vector. So, which would be the center of pressure location. So, the center of pre pre the center of pressure on average for the, uh, this person standing up is going to be somewhere in the middle of these of his two feet. If we were to look at the measurements of these two plates separately, we could see two ground reaction force vectors that would be under this individual's feet. If the person w were to lean forwards. And so, uh, so that uh, more of their pressure was at, at the front of the foot, we would see their center of pressure migra migra migrate, for them, migrate forwards. If we were to see them put, uh, start putting a lot more weight on one, side, on one side of their body rather than another, we would see the magnitude of the ground reaction force vector under one of their feet increase and the magnitude of the ground reaction force under their, their other foot decrease. The next biomechanical concept I want you to understand is that of a, the base of support. A body will be biomechanically stable, or more technically statically stable, under the action of gravity if its centre of mass is directly over its base of support. Here we see three shapes resting on a surface. The centre of gravity, or centre of mass because they're interchangeable, of each shape is shown as a black dot, and the gravitational force vector is shown as a dashed line. We see that uh, in the wide triangle and in the narrow triangle, both are statically stable. They're statically stable because the line of action of the gravitational force vector acting on the mass of these bodies falls within their bases of support. The last shape gives us an example where the line of action of the gravitational force vector falls outside of the base of support. In the case of this shape, it will topple over. Next we see two shapes that are balancing on points. In these examples, gravity will act to destabilize the object in, which, in whichever direction the center of mass is relative to the location of the balance point. In maintaining the balance of the body, the base of support is defined by the area that's in contact with the ground. In upright stance, the base of support is the area prescribed by the feet, and we can see this identified with the, uh, in, in, uh, in green at the bottom of the figure. In our example here, we can see that the force vector that results from gravi uh, gravity uh, that, uh, that is acting on the center of mass of the body falls just inside of the base of support. In this situation, it's going to be challenging, although physically possible, to create a ground reaction for a force that can counterbalance the destabilizing torque produced by the pull of gravity on the body. If the person depicted here were to lean forward slightly, the gravitational force vector would then fall outside of the base of support. 
If this were to happen, the body would become biomechanically unstable, would become statically unstable, and no change in where the ground reaction force vector is located will be able to stop the body from falling forwards. Here we can see how different stances can change the base of support area. Standing with the feet together creates the narrowest base of support. Standing with the feet apart increases the medialateral stability uh, of posture. Standing with one foot forwards increases the anterior direction stability, uh, the anterior posterior stability. Lastly, standing or holding a wa walking stick that's planted in the ground in front of you extends the base of support out to the point of, uh, to the point of contact with the ground. Given that this point is both forwards and off to the, off to the side, this, point of, uh, th this increase in, in the base of support area would increase both the medialateral stability, sp stability and the anterior posterior stability. Now I'd like to start talking about biomechanical analysis. Analysis can be defined as any operation that is performed on a set of data. Analysis can simply mean to present the data that you have in another form. For example, the work that we did earlier to calculate a joint angle from the position data can be thought of as an analysis. More complex forms of biomechanical analysis can, uh, can involve combining data from several sources in order to produce or derive variables that are not directly measurable. This kind of analysis is exampled in our calculation of muscle force and joint reaction force that we looked at last le lecture by constructing a free body diagram. In laboratory-based biomechanical research, you will often see researchers combining the use of force plates, motion capture derived skeletal models of the body, muscle models, and EMG data. Such analyses can give information about forces, torques, and energy exchanges that are each associated with effective and efficient movement. Often measurements need to be transformed in some way in order to make them provide more meaningful information about what's happening. We've encountered one example of this when we looked at post-processing of EMG data. The analysis that we saw there involved operations on raw EMG, on raw EMG data in order to transform it into a form that is more closely related to patterns of muscle force generation. A commonly used analysis for trans transforming data from one form into another is frequency analysis. To get you to understand frequency analysis, we will look at the we will look at an analysis of position data that was recorded while a patient with essential tremor traced an Archimedes spiral as part of a clinical test. Here we see the Archimedes spiral tracing task. You start with your pencil placed in the middle, and you have to draw a line that follows the, the path of the spiral outwards. Here we see an example of the task having been performed by a patient. The, t uh, the task here has been performed by a patient with mild essential tremor. We can analyze the trajectory of data like this. In order to do this, First, we need to identify a reference frame. We can see that we've identified a reference frame. We have the y-axis representing movements uh, going up and down the page, and the y-axis representing movements going left and right on the page. Here we see a time-based description of the movement. We are looking at the, uh, motion in the y-axis here. Note that the data that we've got in this time series graph here is from a patient with more severe essential tremor than what we're seeing drawn in the spiral on the bottom left. So I'm simply saying that the data that we've got here is not the same as the data we've got here. Here we have the spiral drawing data from a patient with mild essential tremor. Here we have the analysis that we're going to study for a patient with quite severe essential tremor. Notice that, as we would expect, we, we start with smaller up and down movements 
and then they get larger as the patient gets further and further out in the spiral drawing task. In this data, we can see the tremor as rapid movements that go along with the up and down of the, uh, uh, of the, uh, of the spiral following movements. So here we have the spiral following movements, and here we have the more rapid up and down of the tremor. The question is, does this particular type of graph, this time series graph, give us the best way of quantifying the severity of the tremor? Or could we transform the data in some way, similarly to, to what we did with it when we were thinking about how to represent the EMG data, that would uh, give us more insight into what's going on? Here we see the data at the top transformed into a frequency-based description. On the x-axis of this new graph, we have the frequency of oscillation. On the y-axis, we have the amplitude of oscillation that is seen at each, each frequency. The first spike in this graph occurs at 0.5 Hz. This is an oscillation with a period of 2 seconds. So remember I told you the relationship between period and frequency earlier? That uh, frequency, equals one o uh, frequency equals 1 over the period. When we look at the time series, we see that the main up and down motion of the spiral drawing is going, is going through its cycle in about two seconds. So when we look at the getting from one point in the cycle to the next point in the cycle, it's approximately two seconds. The next peak that we see in the graph here is occurring at around four hertz. This is telling us that we have an oscillation in the movement that has a frequency of four cycles per second. We also learn that the oscillation has an amplitude of about one centimeter. The height of the peak that we're seeing at the four hertz then is especially useful for telling us about the severity of the tremor that we're seeing in the patient. The higher the the higher this peak. Uh, is going to be, the greater the amount of tremor that we'll see in the patient. To understand frequency analysis in more detail, let's look systematically at the relationship between a time-based description of the data in a time series and the frequency-based description of data in the Fourier transforms of the time series data. The Fourier, the Fourier transform represents data in terms of oscillations of particular amplitude. To understand a Fourier transform, let's look at time series that are composed of oscillations of different frequencies and amplitudes. Here we see three different time series graphs, with position on the y-axis and time on the x-axis. In the top graph, we see a sine wave that gets through a full cycle of oscillation in one second. Here we have a one cycle per second oscillation, and therefore a one hertz sine wave. This sine wave has an amplitude oscillation of 1.5. In the middle we have two sine waves. We have both the one, one hertz sine wave in the red, and a three hertz sine wave in green. The green, the, the green sine wave has a smaller amplitude of around 0.4. Lastly, at the bottom, we see three sine waves. Here, we additionally have a 5 hertz sine wave. Now let's look at what we get if we create a time series that's the summation of these sine waves. In the middle, in the middle graph, we see that the time series that you get if you sum up the effects of the red and the, and the green sine waves. At the bottom we see the time series that results from combining the red, the green and the blue sine waves. What you should be noticing here is that complex and co complicated movement patterns can be created by combining, different by combining different oscillations. In fact, any possible movement pattern can be created by combining oscillations of different amplitudes and phasings. Let's now finally look at how these uh, time series will look when we represent them with a Fourier transform. If we look at the graph at the bottom, 
we will uh, we have frequency on the on the x-axis and amplitude on the y-axis we can see three three spikes in the plot occurring at one hertz three hertz and five uh, five hertz this then uh, is going to be revealing the oscillations that exist in the time series the heights of these spikes are going to be the amplitudes of oscillation so here we have a pattern of movement that's revealed in the time series here we have a pattern of oscillations that's revealing the uh, the particular uh, the particular period of oscill oscillations and amplitudes of oscillations that are composing our time series on the last few slides we saw how a Fourier transform can be used to transform a time series description of the data into a frequency based description of the data we saw how a frequency based description can give us useful insights into particular qualities particular aspects of movement data now I want to talk about how a Fourier transform can be used to filter noisy data. Motion recording technology is not perfect. Often imperfections in the, in the, in the movement rec recording can cre create what we call noise in the data that has nothing to do uh, with how the body is actually moving. Looking at the top, in the graph at the top, you can see a recording from a person asked to hold their arm out in front of them and to keep their hand steady. On the y-axis, we have the vertical position of their hand, and on the x-axis, we have time. You can see that they managed to hold their hand at roughly the same height throughout the trial. You will also notice that the movements seem very erratic and are, to be honest, inconsistent with the task of keeping their hand still. The changes that we're seeing here are so erratic that they're not, in fact, biologically plausible. The noisiness in this data is not due to pathology. It's due to noise in the motion capture system. So what can we do about this? First, what we can do is we can transform our data into a frequency-based description. So this is taking us from the graph at the, at the top down to the, the, the uh, uh, down one step. Here we see that there are many different oscillations in our data. While the oscillations that we see at lower frequencies are biologically, biologically plausible, the ones at higher frequencies are not. So what can we do to rectify our situation of having noisy data? What we can do to rectify this situation is to use the analysis technique of frequency filtering or more specifically the technique of low pass filtering. When you compare the second graph down to the third graph down, you can see that the higher frequencies have been removed from the frequency based description. So as we go from here down to here, we can see that we have operated on our data so as to remove these high frequency components. If we now take this modified frequency-based description and turn it back into a time-based description, we see that the noisiness in the data has been removed. So by virtue of moving these high-frequency oscillations from the data that are biologically implausible, when we turn this frequency data back into a time-based description, we end up seeing the uh, the actual trajectory of the movement that doesn't have this noisiness in it. Next, I want to talk through another technique for removing unwanted noise from movement data. We just looked at frequency filtering. Here we're going to look at a different technique called moving average filtering, or as it's sometimes called, data smoothing. Here we can see some noisy data. In order to smoothen this data, in order to filter it with a moving average filter, we're going to create a window with a width of 51 samples, and we're going to place it at the start of our data. So here you see with our, the blue box that we've just placed there, that's creating a window that is 51 samples long. We're then going to calculate the average value of all of the samples that fall inside the window 
and we're going to plot that average in a new graph. So the, the value of the average of all of the points in this window is going to be used to create the first point in this graph down here. Next, we're going to shift the window along slightly and then recalculate the average of the points inside the window. If we do this again and again, as we systematically slide the window across the time series, we're going to create a new, new time series in which the noisiness has been averaged away. We can change the width of the window to change how severe the smoothing is. Here we see the smooth time series when we've used an averaging window with a width of 11 frames rather than 51. The next analyses that we need to consider for this class are time normalization and amplitude normalization. On this slide, we're going to look at a study of people performing pointing movements. In this study, they recorded motion tracked positions of a sensor placed on the wrist. In this experiment, an LED lights up, you move to touch it, then another LED lights up, and then you move to touch that LED. In this experiment, sometimes you're asked to perform the task slowly, and other times you're asked to perform it as quickly as you can. Here we see data for the tangential velocity of the wrist as a function of different speeds of movement. In each curve, we see the wrist starts out still, it starts out still with no velocity and then speeds up. And then about halfway through the motion, it slows down again until it stops. This bell shaped profile characterizes many types of human movement. The slower mov movements start earlier and finish later. The slower movements also have a lower peak tangential velocity. So given this data, is there a way to see if there's a common or normal profile to this type of movement? Is there a common characteristic to the movements that we're seeing that's shared across the different movements performed at different speeds? Here we see the data that we have in the top graph after it's been time normalized and amplitude normalized. With time normalization, we identify the moment that the movement starts and the movement and the and the moment where the movement ends, and we draw two lines to represent those points. We then take each of our recordings in the top graph, identify their start and end points in the, uh, in their recordings, and then either stretch the data or compress the data to so it, to fit it between the two lines. With amplitude normalization, we do the same except with the height of the movement. Here we would identify a particular, a particular point, such as the point of maximum velocity in each time series, and then either pull up or push down on each profile until all of the peak velocities of all of the time series match. Normalization is used to reveal characteristic profiles of movement. We can see here that even though the, mo the, the movements of these participants were performed at very different speeds, there's a clearly identifiable profile to her movements across each of the different types of movement that were performed. The last thing I want to talk about today is biomechanical models. Biomechanical models represent some of the most complex form of forms of biomechanical analysis. One of the main functions of biomechanical models is to be able to create a methodology for testing hypotheses about underlying causes. For example, if you see an abnormal movement pattern in a patient, <coughs> excuse me, that is abnormal movement kinematics, a biomechanical model can be used to tell you that the abnormal pattern is caused by a particular, a, a particular muscle weakness or weakness at one particular joint. Ideally, you want to have a, biome a biomechanical model that is complex enough to capture the causal structure of movement. A biomechanical model often has a muscle model and a link segment model. The muscle model is a model that contains information about the properties of a muscle, such as physiological and anatomical cross-sectional area. The muscle model takes in information about Muscle, uh, it takes in information about muscle recruitment. It 
then outputs predictions about muscle forces. The link segment model contains information about how the body is configured. This includes things like where, uh, where, where, where the bones are located in the body, how the bones move relative to each other, what are the insertion points of the muscles, what are the lines of action of the muscles, and where are the centers or centers of mass of the body segments. The link segment model takes in information about the forces generated by the muscles and the external forces that are acting on the body. This model makes predictions, uh, makes a prediction of the patterns of motion that should result from these causes. This includes predictions about what uh, joint angles that, will, that you'll see, what angular velocities that you'll see, what angular accelerations that you'll see, and the linear displacements, velocities, and accelerations of the body. On the last slide, we talked through how a link segment model could be used to predict the movement kinematics we should see given a, a knowledge of muscle forces and external forces. Doing this is referred to as calculating a direct solution. It is called direct as the modeling we're doing follows the typically assumed direction of causal flow. That is, where muscle forces combined with external forces are the causes of the movement. We can also run this modeling process the other way. We can start with info information about osteokinematics, and if we know the external forces, we can then calculate and we can then derive the muscle forces and the joint torques. This type of process is called calculating an inverse solution. It's called inverse because we're working in a uh, we're working in the opposite direction to the typically assumed direction of causal flow, where. Muscle forces combined with external forces are seen to be the causes of, of the motion. When you come across the term inverse dynamics in your studies, this is referring to the fact that an inverse solution has been calculated. Okay, this completes our fifth lecture on the foundations of biomechanics.